Hello everyone. Obviously we've had some big news over the last couple of days, namely the complete reversal of uh, Microsoft's DRM policies on the Xbox One. And uh, here to discuss this with me today is the very gentleman I was discussing it with initially. Alan, how are you? Hello everyone. I'm um, excited and confused. Excited and confused? I thought Indeed. it was uh, quite clear what they were up to. What's the source <laughs> of confusion? Well... Uh, What's confused me, really, is um, not so much what Microsoft have done, but the way people seem to be reacting to it. Oh, yeah. Um, which is this sort of mass relief. I've seen people popping up, coming out of the woodwork, who'd previously denounced their claims to Xbox One, suddenly going, actually, it's all changed! You've redeemed yourselves, I'm going back to the Xbox! And I find this really, really baffling, not to mention slightly alarming. Well, I think in many regards, uh, there are a lot of elements here that do actually explain that. I mean, for one thing, as you were discussing um, the last time we were talking about this, there's the issue of console loyalty, and yeah. that Microsoft has alienated its core crowd. And I think at the very least, for me, I could now see myself purchasing an Xbox One at some point in the future. Now, I... Personally, if I get a console, obviously I'm primarily PC, but if I get a console, I'm going to be going PS4 because it still seems like the much better deal. But on the other hand, the Xbox is now actually on the radar. So I think if yeah. people were interested in the Xbox One, if people genuinely did like the features that uh, were being touted, you know, the, the, the crowd who's more interested in television than gaming. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I couldn't resist. Um, then um, I think this obviously now does remove one of the huge hurdles. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a fair point. From a practical standpoint, the Xbox One has become more viable again, that's true. Um, and I think Microsoft have earned some credit, you know, to give credit where it is due. Not Definitely. many corporations the size of Microsoft would pull a complete reversal on a major policy like this. Well, as so, Major Nelson said, was it Major Nelson or Don Matrick, we can't just flip the switch? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, I was going to um, mention something about that, actually. Um, interview with Major Nelson where he said, it's not just that easy to take this feature out, you know. Yeah. I think yeah. it was, was it Angry Joe or something? Yeah, I think, it was, uh, Angry Joe was saying that he um, knew it was easy and to so switch. So he, and... He, yeah, and said uh, something like, you know, you're taking a lot of flack for this online everyday thing. Couldn't you just take it out? I actually got You're not on the development team. Don't tell me how easy it is to take out. <laughs> I've, I've actually got suddenly, an amusing little anecdote on that one. Um, after Joe posted that interview, I I, wrote, I made a tweet basically saying, um, you know, it's basically how Nelson is a master of PR and spin. You know, it's how every time Joe says anything, um, the immediate response from Nelson is something that is positive about the Xbox that Joe can't <laughs> deny without Joe sounding like he's being an arsehole. Yeah. And uh, Joe took that the wrong way. So I actually got a somewhat curt tweet from him, which... Um, was somewhat unfortunate given the fact that I really like the guy, but on the off chance yeah. that he's watching this, please accept my apologies. I did clarify <laughs> it, so uh, hopefully that's uh, that's um. resolved. But I think it does show a lot of bullshit, really, not just for what we were told, but also maybe what was going on within Microsoft. I mean, at the end of the day, um, people like Nelson and Matrick are wheeled up there to defend the policies. Um, I don't think they have a huge amount of say of what those policies are. Uh, Matrix the head of Xbox division, I think, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um, so maybe not so much in that case, but there's... I don't think there's what... You can't really pin the blame on them squarely. They're just doing their jobs and defending it. But then again, how well informed have they been as well? Because that's something that I think is an interesting point that's that true. could be raised. But um, as I say, I will give credit to Microsoft for reversing the DRM... But I still yeah. think that they've made one very nasty cock-up, and that is mm. to pull the family sharing plan. The one good thing that they managed to get out of this, and they've pulled it back, <laughs> and I think, to, to me, it smacks of um, a kid throwing their toys out of the pram, because this could still be implemented. You could simply have uh, two systems, two agreements, if you will. When you first set up your Xbox One, it asks you, do you want the 360 style arrangement where you have the used games, no online connection, but no family sharing? Or would you like to opt into the DRM but get all these bonuses as well? You know, so you give people the choice. And I think if they'd have done that, we'd have satisfied both parties. Because what I'm seeing 
is not so much relief, but there's been this sort of counter wave of hate about the fact that family sharing was removed. And mm. I think that Microsoft might be trying to play the community against itself by trying to point at the people who are complaining about the DRM and saying, these people have taken away your nice shinies, when in matter of fact, I think Microsoft could have kept it. Probably. I, I hadn't thought of that. But it's, they're certainly sneaky enough to try something like that. Mm. Um, but the, one of the things I've I've wondered about with this whole sudden apparent reversal um, is what caused it. Because although there's been this whole wave of outpouring of loathing, um, it's there's a fairly strong track record of companies who pull any kind of reversal like this. Hmm. prompting an equal wave of disgust. In fact, I think Microsoft have had it themselves. Um, they they pulled a sudden reversal on something to do with Windows 8, I think. I oh, can't yeah, they've, what, uh, they're bringing back yeah. the start button after popular demand. Um, oh, yeah, the start menu thing. Yeah. But there was this outpouring of hate for that because people just sort of don't like the... I assume it's maybe the dishonesty hmm. um, of them banging on about how important these these things were and then suddenly changing their minds. Hmm. So it seems like actually a risky decision um, responding to all this yeah. criticism. Well you're damned if you don't, you're damned if you do. You can please yeah. some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time hmm. and unfortunately uh, this is one of those cases where it simply wasn't possible to get that. I don't think they're going to get a clear majority on anything but I think this hmm. direction is the best. I honestly think they could have had their cake and eaten it like I was saying earlier. But um, I think this direction ultimately is better at the moment. And I have been thinking on this, and honestly, I can see what Microsoft wanted to do. And I think what they wanted to do was not necessarily noble, but inevitable. Um, mm. In that interview when Nelson's talking about, you got to, do you, you, you want to come to the future with me, Joe? Do you want to come to the future? <laughs> um, I do think that he was right. I do think that these policies eventually are going to become the norm. The problem is that Microsoft implement did everything wrong with the implementation. Um, they didn't give anybody the assurances of the benefits it would bring. Um, they focused far too much on responding to the negativity instead of tr and trying to say, oh, it's not a negative, instead of saying, yes, you're giving up this convenience, but look at what we're giving you in return. And I think that's that was, what that's what Valve's done with Steam, and Steam's taken Steam took off. It got off to a rocky start, but it got there. <laughs> and that that was actually something that surprised me to no end with people like Don Matrick and Major Nelson, whose job is basically PR, or at least a large part of it is, um, and to put a positive spin on all this stuff. The way they got so defensive, rather than um, going, yes, okay, there are some drawbacks. They can see what you mean about that, but they're far outweighed by all these fantastic things. They came out with all this, well, tough shit yeah. kind of attitude, which I found very strange. If you want to be offline, we've got a console thing. for that. It's called Xbox 360. <laughs> I know. That was painful. That was, yeah. Um, but that's that's the thing I want people to take away from this, and this is the thing that confused me when I said I'm confused at the outset. The practicality of Xbox One may have been restored, hmm. where all these things that were putting people off are now gone, or a lot of them are. Yeah, but the attitude that we got from Microsoft in the wake of the Xbox One reveal and E3 is still there. Yeah, they've changed what they're doing, but they haven't changed their attitude to us. Yeah. We're still this necessary inconvenience. You know, we've mm -hmm. destroyed the first Death Star, but the Empire hasn't hit back yet. <laughs> <laughs> that is possibly the geekiest analogy I have ever heard. <laughs> I would tip my hat to you, but I'm, I don't have one. In fact, hang on, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm going to put on a hat. Just so that I can tip it to you. <laughs> but the um I do think that this this is gonna be the future, but they made several key mistakes. One of this was the PR, focusing too much on being defensive on the negative and not emphasizing the positive. And the other again reels back to what I was saying earlier about how they don't need to take this digital thing away all at once. People hate change. Alright, there are some people out there who get on with it, but by and large people hate change, even if it's a change for the better. So,
by allowing two um, ideologies, shall we say, to run side by side, you can eventually get people to come over to the to the digital um, distribution. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know if they were trying to, if they were banking on people being like gobsmacked and awed that the future had finally arrived and everyone wanted to jump on the train, mm -hmm. or if they didn't want to deal with like a two tier system, or mm -hmm. if it never occurred to them to do that, which I find hard to believe. Or even well, if they are literally just throwing their toys out the pram now, but <laughs> there were ways they could have implemented this, and there were ways they could have got the community on board, and maybe in about two to three years, um, have actually got like most of a vast majority of their people on the agreement that they wanted them on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I wondered if what what they were doing. You've made me wonder now if it's if it is this kind of look. You can't have this lovely thing without these other hmm. things that you don't want. But my initial feeling um, was that it was um, reverting to a stance of complete status quo, which yeah. is what um, A lot of the hate Sony is actually based on that, yeah. Again, we're showing you as little change as possible, hmm. and I, I wondered if that was Microsoft's sort of knee-jerk reaction game. Okay, people don't want change, we'll change nothing. Yeah, that's, uh, that's or, entirely we'll possible. Yeah. With, with, with people not, as I say, people don't like change, so the idea of maintaining the status quo is appealing. So I will admire anyone willing to take a risk, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I will admire the risk they are willing to take <laughs> or the way that they take that risk. Yeah. So yeah. I don't I don't have any particular hate. I don't, I don't have anything personal against Microsoft for the ideas behind this, because as I've said, eventually I think this is the future. But... Yeah right now isn't the right time for it and when they do want to bring it in they need to be a lot more careful with it they've got enough people who are interested in the purely digital distribution model who are interested in the redefinition of ownership of games that they can sell it and if they provide the two side by side eventually people will see the benefits of that digital distribution however Microsoft also needs to be offering people more um, with PC gaming, we pretty much gave up everything that the Xbox One demanded people gave up when we started adopting Steam as our primary means of gaming. We gave up used sales, uh, we gave up direct ownership of our games, but we got a lot out of it. We got a platform that automatically kept all our games updated, we got integrated community features, we got sales so that we didn't even need to worry about used games. Yeah. We got the prices of games decreasing as the games got older, something which Xbox Live, I think, has been absolutely atrocious for. Yeah, even their really old Xbox is. releases are still like 15, 20 quid where you could pick them up for a five or second hand. Yeah. Um, and we got all these benefits. I and mean, even with backwards compatibility, GOG's got your back. You know, we've got um, we've got everything on PC with this digital distribution system, and Microsoft needs to be able to put out the message that it can offer all of these things as a replacement. Right now, it comes back to that discussion that we had on the first of these videos: arrogance. They seem yeah. to think that just because they've got the image, we should all accept it. And in reality, and this is something that I think is really made me feel so warm and fuzzy about this uh, whole charade consumers are finally realising that they do have some power and that they don't have to bow down to absolutely everything that companies say and if they do want something changed they do have the power to do that so hopefully yeah. we'll see more of this in the future and yeah absolutely yeah is that that is that's been the uplifting thing about all this recent really more than the actual fact of the changes to microsoft's policy it's this demonstration that if this many consumers get this vocal and speak with the the main language that microsoft understands which is not oh. buying their stuff the pre-orders on amazon i think had a huge push. impact on what we saw yeah yeah so um on a tangent is there anything more that you want to say about this um, reversal um no, I don't think so. Not at this point. Yeah. Um, we'll see what comes, because as I said, I don't think we've seen the last of any of this. Microsoft mm -hmm. is still the evil empire, and this we haven't defeated them. This won't be the last time they try to shaft us. I think, so just uh, keep your eyes open, people. One of the um, major complaints that I've seen at the moment on a lot of the communities I'm on is, well, if they can turn it off this easily, 
mm. uh, what's to stop them turning it on again so easily in a year's time when they've got it in everyone's houses what's to stop them going flip I don't think oh, they would because no. such a colossal change in terms of service I think would probably mm. be illegal um, and even then it would be after the backlash they've had against it it would be suicide to do it I don't think they'd do it but the fact that people think that they would means that consumer confidence has been severely rocked and yeah. that is uh, that is not something that Microsoft is going to be able to recover from quickly. Yeah. And that's why even if Microsoft have pulled a 180 I don't plan to. Mm. They've damaged my faith in them too much. Okay. Faith is perhaps too strong a word but <laughs> <laughs> my, my relative lack of malignance towards them. Okay, so related, obviously, to the Xbox One is that used games are going to continue as they have. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that the used game market is as problematic as they say? If so, what do you think the future holds for it? I think used games... I have mixed feelings about this because um, traditionally I've been a big used game buyer myself because I've spent so much time impoverished over the last decade or so. Penniless student. Um, <laughs> indeed. Um, so, sort of on a gut, self-interested level, my feeling is don't take my used games away. Hmm. But I'll come back to that in a second. Um, the, other, the other side of this is I do see their point that um, the developers and publishers of games get nothing out of resale. Yeah. So, I can see what they mean on that front. And I thought that was actually one of the um, one of the things I was less sure about in Sony's sort of defiance of Microsoft at E3, hmm. where they were saying all these things Microsoft is doing, we're not doing them. I thought used games might be the one that they'd regret saying that about. Yeah, um, because that seems like the one most likely to actually cost money. Yeah, I think the I don't think anyone can deny that obviously used games are going to be costing the industry well not the industry but the publishers and developers money because um, obviously un unlike say a car games don't degrade a game could change hands dozens and dozens of times before the disc finally gets too um, scratched out and obviously that's yeah. dozens of sales that uh, they've missed out on I think the question more is does the industry really need that extra revenue or is this just greed mm. now um, some people um, a cliffy B oh, <laughs> terrible terrible cough um, seem to think that's so whereas a lot of the feeling from journalists and so forth is not so much but then again as you were saying with um, obviously you've got a vested interest in this um, how can we get some straight up figures because I'm never going to trust figures that come from the industry on this no. <laughs> and um, likewise I don't think the industry is ever going to um, acknowledge any information that takes away its ability to threaten its market oh, that bloody camera's gone again sorry people <laughs> so yeah I don't think the I don't think we're ever going to get some proper figures on that until, yeah, or should I, should I rather say, if the industry actually collapses completely? Mm. Well, I, I feel like, um, and, and this is basically all educated guesswork, because as you mm. said, without trustworthy figures, um, we're, we're limited on the sort of hard data front. Um, but my feeling about um, used games sort of costing the industry, or developers and publishers in the industry, um, is that it's going to be sort of medium-sized development houses that are going to be hit by this. Hmm. Um, because the big ones can kind of absorb it. And tiny little independent studios aren't going to be affected anyway, because they, they make precious little money. And a lot of them um, operate but, through digital primarily anyway. Yeah, but that's, that's what I was thinking. I think the um, sort of medium-sized developers are probably going to start going more digital anyway, in which case this whole used game thing is going to become more of an irrelevance as time goes on. Yeah. I mean, I imagine as digital purchasing becomes more and more prevalent, what we'll end up with primarily in physical form is sort of collector's editions of things, like those gargantuan, <sighs> monstrous Call of Duty commemorative things that come out. Get a I mean, pair of night vision goggles with your game. 
Yeah. Why? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I... I don't know. Mm. Used, used games is a thorny one. Um, and as I said, I, I have my own vested interest in it. But... Um, a large part of that, that vested interest, the reason that I and presumably a lot of other people um, wouldn't, don't want to lose the ability to buy used games, is because new games are so goddamn expensive. Yeah, I mean... Um, Disproportionately so, really. There was, say, there was rumours initially that obviously Microsoft was going to drop the price on um, first-hand games if it knew that publishers could get income from second-hand games. And my immediate response to that is virtually no company in the world is going to pass profits back to its consumers. They have to be forced to do that through competition. And if there's no competition, they will not return any increased profits to you. And I think I was born out on that because the price of um, an Xbox One game was going to be set by Microsoft at a standard of $60. And I think over here at the moment, the price of a new game is something like 42 to £45. Pounds which is uh, quite a lot, really. Yeah. That's, um, you know, for £42, that's about a week and a half, two weeks of food for one person. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's a, as you say, it's, it's a thorny one, but it, again, it comes back to this idea that you've got Microsoft have to give us something back. Yeah. They can't just take and take and then say... Well, if you do this, the industry, if you don't do this, the industry is going to fall over and die, uh, which seems to be what Cliffy B thinks. His Twitter feed <laughs> since the DRM um, fiasco has been glorious. <laughs> um, he's basically predicted some sort of apocalypse, um, the dead rising from their graves, <laughs> um, dogs, cats living together under the same roof, you know... It, the oh, whole shebang, uh, saying your publishing houses are going to be closing, microtransactions are going to be going through the roof, mobile gaming is going to become the main thing. We're all doomed. <laughs> and well, the thing um, is, regardless of whether he's right about the causes, I've heard a couple of people predict something like this. I mean, we've seen it before. Those of us who are old enough. Uh, the crash of '83. Mm. I wasn't even going to glint in the milkman's no. eye then, well. but uh, I am familiar <laughs> yeah. with the aftermath because obviously yeah. I was um, I was brought up when the um, the new shoots started sprouting through the ashes of that. Because obviously I was raised on the NES, the Mega Drive, and um, what was that other one that came along a little bit later? The PlayStation was it? <laughs> <laughs> Rings a bell. Yeah, yeah. But um, I was reading an article by Jim Sterling. And who's basically saying that even if the industry does collapse, we know it's going to come back again. And the problem is at the moment it's worth so much money that its collapse is going to be a pretty huge event. Um, back in the back in eighty three, it obviously wasn't so much of a big deal. It was uh, getting on quite a big industry, and when um, its profits, well, when, when the when the worth of the industry fell by ninety seven percent, I think is the figure. Uh, it obviously had a considerable impact. So imagine these days, the fall of an industry that's, I think, now worth more than Hollywood would be considerable. But I think Cliffy B's attitude also kind of shows how the industry is in many ways bringing it on itself. Now, I don't think anyone can complain, I don't think anyone can argue that games have become more expensive to make. So graphics have gone up, you need to spend more time creating more detailed models, you need to spend more time creating more detailed environments, the sound quality has gone up, you can't just use chip tunes anymore, you have to hire full orchestras to make your music. They've, the, the cost of producing these games has skyrocketed in order to make full use of the hardware. But at the same time, I do think there eventually needs to be a point where you get to there needs to be a point where the games are just too expensive there needs to be a point where these are no longer financially viable products and i think square enix recently felt that sting because uh, sleeping dogs and tomb raider apparently both failed to hit sales targets and there are a number of theories as to why some people are saying that it's because um Square Enix's other financial difficulties meant that these IPs needed to perform really well to claw the company back. 
Um, others are saying that it's kind of an internal tension between the Western developers and the Japanese developers with the Western developers feeling that in the wake of things like Final Fantasy XIV, they're having to prop up the Japanese developers in, in Western markets. But of course, the other popular theory is they just cost too damn much to make. And therefore, yeah. even if they're selling millions of copies, I think they sold something like over two million copies each. Mm -hmm. And yet, yeah, th these figures are huge. Even by AAA standards, two million is a damn respectable score. Fucking yeah. Bob just let itself in. Ah, oh, damn it. Um, <laughs> so, if you can't make that money back, then the project isn't viable anymore. Yeah. And if you expect the consumer to pick up the tab and not receive anything extra back, then I don't think that... Personally, I don't think that's fair. I mean, you can argue no. that they're getting higher quality games in return, but again... As I'm saying, there needs to be a point where it's just too expensive. You can't expect to make those sales at any price. Yeah, and I feel like there's um, there's kind of a diminishing return going on with um, investment into the production of games. Where I say again, I have no idea what a game budget is these days, but say a game costs four million to yeah. make, um, then you know, you've got you could probably knock a million off that and not lose relatively that much. Like, not lose a quarter of the quality or content. I think well, once you've pumped so much money into it, you can keep putting more money in it and only see incremental increases in quality, hmm. relatively. Well, I'm not a developer, so I wouldn't be able to comment, but um, it just does strike me from a purely business perspective. Mm. If you're sinking so much money in, then and you're not getting that money back, then perhaps the better solution is not to sink so much money in. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I like Cliffy B. I like I like Epic Games. I think um, Epic is a company that knows exactly what sort of games it makes. It knows exactly who its target audience is, and it plays to those strengths fantastically. And again, I think Cliffy B, as a developer, when he was working with Epic. Is uh, was one of the better things that happened with the company. I have a lot of respect for the guy for doing what he did. Unfortunately, I, I just can't agree with him on this idea that we should expect game budgets to keep going up and up and up and up and up. There, there must be a point eventually where, as you say, diminishing returns comes in, even if it's just from a financial perspective. And my opinion is that the people above the people who are actually making the games in a lot of these companies have got it into their heads that big budgets mean better games. Yeah. And big budgets mean more movie-like games. They mean more cinematic games. They mean flashier games. They don't necessarily mean better games. Mm -hmm. And until the people who hold the purse strings and direct the flow of money realise that you can create really great games with lesser money... They're going to keep insisting on pumping more and more and more money in on the assumption that it's going to create a more competitive product. And that, I think, could very well lead us into a new video game crash. Now, obviously, the crash of 83 was caused by something very different. It was caused by oversaturation. Uh, too many consoles, too many games, too much crap. No one was getting a big enough slice of the pie to actually feed themselves, and the whole thing fell down. In this case, the companies are eating themselves and not the pie. If they're unwilling to settle for smaller budgets, and if we as gamers are unwilling to settle for smaller budgets, then either they do need to find a new place to get increased revenue, be it used game sales or increasing the um, cost of games, or they face closure. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, I don't see them breaking this mentality that they need to throw more money at the problem. Yeah. But a and guy can I, I, <laughs> And I assume it's it's kind of a self defeating stance where they they want to make better games so they sell more, so they put more money into the game, which means they then have to make more money back. So the the harder they try to make good games, the more they have to sell hmm. to recoup their expenses. So it just becomes a self defeating yeah. circle. Um, but I think I, I think this is at least one of the major things 
to which we can attribute this rise in indie games, which is a whole separate discussion. Hmm. But um, and one that I'm sure you would love to have at some point. <laughs> yeah, um, but I think that's that's a symptom of this that a fairly significant wedge of consumers are saying, you know, we we don't need these colossal budgets for really cinematic games. We will take cheaper games with much lower budgets that are still fun and enjoyable and well done. They don't have to be lavish. Yeah. Um, and I say, uh, quite a few of the Paradox Interactive as well recently enjoyed a lot of their uh, success with Crusader Kings 2. Uh, Paradox has always been a very, very niche publisher. And yet Crusader Kings 2 is something that's well, it's not broken into the mainstream. If you consider mainstream to be Halo and COD, then it's not broken into the mainstream. But it's found a huge audience compared to what Paradox games normally do. And given the sheer complexity and intricateness of Crusader Kings 2, I'm astonished that it's found such a large audience. It's normally only obsessive compulsive nerds with no life, such as myself, who, uh, who can get into these sorts of games. But um, the fact that it's found its audience in um, such a large audience I think speaks a lot about other directions the industry could go in they've just got tunnel vision that the games need to be bigger and more expensive and better graphics and better sounds and uh, more multiplayer gameplay and this, there are other directions that you can explore even yeah. within the realms of the AAA you can do other things they just no one seems to be prepared to be bold and innovative anymore. The last game I played where I was re the last AAA game I say I should say that I played that I thought was really innovative and inventive was Arkham Asylum. And <laughs> since Arkham Asylum I have seen loads of games that ripped Arkham Asylum off. <laughs> Remember me being the most recent one. Mm -hmm. And there just seems to be so few publishers in the AAA sphere willing to take that risk. And I think that's what's killing them. They're having to keep going down this same expensive road and they're too terrified to risk losing money on a project that might well redefine what AAA gaming is. Yeah, yeah. And if we do continue down this road and they maintain their tunnel vision, then we could indeed be coming to some sort of industry apocalypse. Well, um, that'd be interesting know, to see. I know people who'd welcome it. I've heard people saying, well, the industry will emerge sort of stronger and and freer and things will be all wonderful you know frolicking meadows of gaming <laughs> on the far side but aside from the fact that, that that's a little optimistic i mean it will it will emerge in some form and maybe it will be yeah. better um but the fact is that now it's such a huge industry actual people are going to be affected by this mm. thousands of people out of work mm. and the, not to mention the economic contributions of the industry to the countries where they're Based, the the, the video game industry here in the UK beyond. is getting tax breaks because it's contributing so yeah. much. Yeah, it's it's gone beyond just the effects on games and the consumers. Now, if mm. there is a crash, it's going to be much bigger and much more dramatic than that. But from the st from the selfish perspective of a gamer, perhaps it's what the industry needs. Perhaps we're going to see it, and you know, maybe a um, eighty three, eighty ninety, you know, twenty, a thirty, forty year cycle. Of um, you know, hat slash and burn, <laughs> from, um, current uh, leading into grassroots growing up and a brand new industry taking hold, and then the whole thing needing <laughs> to be scythed down again for uh, to make way Sorry, for the new I, I blood. Just, um, I just had a mental flash of the Matrix. <laughs> Spoilers for anyone who hasn't yet seen the last Matrix film. Oh come on, That's no one's not seen the last kind of... Matrix film. If you haven't seen the last <laughs> Matrix film, don't. Whatever you're imagining is better. <laughs> no, that, that thing with civilization being wiped out and then started again from scratch and a promised one arising. And Yes, the promised one is whoever, indie games, Microsoft, whatever. Mm. And then it's all wiped out and it all starts anew and no one remembers the previous time. Well, I think that's all we're going to have time for, so uh, I'm going to have to cut you short there. Are there any final points that you want to make? Are there any names that you want to plug or websites you want to whore? No, I don't plug or whore. All right, well, I'll plug or whore on your behalf. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Alan of the Indie Ocean. Uh, I'm Evis T, signing off. Bye all.